Hello, my name is Aaron Heckroff, and I'm going to tell you about our final project for EC521 Cybersecurity at Boston University. We're going with the content presented in Bad USB, a conference talk given at Black Hat 2014 about the vulnerability of USB devices to firmware reprogramming. We're going to give you some background information on USB, and then we're going to go into how you can exploit both the flexible nature of USB and people's trust in familiar USB devices to implement some pretty nasty attacks. As a communications protocol, USB's model for abstraction is pretty similar to the OSI model. A device identifies itself when it's plugged in, it's given an address by the OS, and drivers are loaded to interface with it. USB was designed to be flexible and to be used for many different applications, which is why it's present on nearly all modern personal computers. And on each USB device, there must be some component that speaks USB back to the operating system, which we're going to call the USB controller. USB controllers communicate with the operating system via packets. This is a Wireshark capture of USB transmission packets. They're pretty similar to the packets you'd see between computers on a network. All devices exist on the same bus, and each packet needs a destination composed of a USB device address and an endpoint. The packets also need to encode the protocols used in addition to the data being sent. With the right tools, all USB traffic is sniffable, and sensitive applications should encrypt this data to avoid reverse engineering. USB communication is complicated by the fact that physical ports do not map to individual devices. The image on the right shows a list of USB devices connected to one of our laptop computers. As you can see, all those USB receiver devices represent just one Logitech unifying receiver for communicating with a wireless keyboard. Perhaps more worrying, the webcam and Bluetooth radio devices are both internal devices that are permanently embedded in the computer. While we might consider a webcam a single device, it may actually represent several different USB devices with different classes, such as audio and video. Bad USB focused on attacks charting USB sticks, which are ubiquitous, inexpensive, and as it turns out, pretty vulnerable to manipulation. Here's what a USB stick looks like without its plastic casing. USB drives contain a number of different components, but the ones important to this talk are the NAND flash, where the data is stored, and the USB controller, which must communicate between the flash memory and the computer via a USB port. Nearly every component in the device can vary between drives, even within the same model or family of drives from a single manufacturer. We looked at 16 USB flash drives from many manufacturers, all of which were either purchased from a retailer or received for free as giveaways. We examined the controllers used in each and tried to find trends that might suggest which ones are the most common and whether there is a link between the drive manufacturer and the chips contained inside. The results show that these drives are optimized to reduce cost as much as possible. Markings on the parts are practically useless in finding documentation despite the fact that generic controllers are used in many different devices from a range of manufacturers. What's really worrying is that a very small number of vendors provide the bulk of all the controllers. This means that an attack targeted at a common controller could affect a staggering number of devices. While some manufacturers, such as SanDisk, keep very tight control over their devices, leaked tools exist for reprogramming the firmware on many of the more common controllers. Taking advantage of some of these firmware tools, we found that this is the most common configuration required to parse packets captured from a USB flash drive and to generate our own custom packets. A 16-byte SCSI opcode is required to properly access or send data to the device, but since there are relatively few reserved vendor opcodes, you can fuzz vendor commands until you get an interesting SCSI response. The NAND flash used in these USB devices is so unreliable that the controllers must be reprogrammable in order to interface with it. For example, one of our USB sticks was labeled as a 1 gigabyte drive, but actually contained 4 gigabytes of NAND flash, with 3 gigs of slack space blocked off by the controller because of manufacturing defects. The reprogrammable nature of these controllers makes them almost universally susceptible to attack. Custom firmware could be written to force a flash drive's USB controller to perform the functions of nearly any other USB device. Since the operating system has an inherent trust in USB devices and the USB controller can lie to the OS about its device class or other information, preventing these attacks in software is extremely difficult. USB device vendors rely on security through obscurity, but despite this, the documentation for several tools is readily available, and traffic can be sniffed to work out custom protocols. Replay attacks on USB communication are trivial, and the firmware data is largely sent unencrypted for SMI and FISIN controllers. Drives reprogrammed with a malicious custom firmware could do a lot of damage. To try out some of these tools, we reverse engineered an SMI controller found in two of our USB sticks. We wrote a program capable of reading and writing the controller identification section of the firmware by replaying SMI vendor commands. 
This program allows us to spoof much of the descriptive information about the drive. This means that there is no OS query that can uniquely identify it from any other drive, which means a whitelist or blacklist is useless in preventing it from attacking you. We've shown that it's possible to reprogram nearly any USB device, and with enough time and determination you could develop some really cool attacks. The problem is that it's slow and complicated and kind of hard on the drives to do this kind of work. The bad USB presentation included multiple attack demonstrations, including using a USB drive as a network adapter for phishing attacks. The problem is that after their presentation, all the drives containing controllers susceptible to their reverse engineered firmware have been taken off the market. That means it's really hard to replicate their attacks without reverse engineering our own firmware, which we didn't have time to do. Instead, we asked ourselves why we were hacking USB drives in the first place, and the answer was that people trust them. People are more likely to plug a device into their computer if it seems trustworthy, and compromised USB drives take advantage of that. What we wanted was a USB device that could be reprogrammed to execute any command we want, but still looked like a conventional USB flash drive. To solve this problem, we decided to make our own device that would allow us to replicate some of the functionality of the attacks presented in bad USB. This is the Scam Disk. It's a USB attack tool disguised as a flash drive that allows you to execute human interface device attacks. The Scam Disk has a 3D printable enclosure. It's built around the Teensy 3.1, which is easily reprogrammable thanks to the Arduino framework. It's also open source and highly accessible. Sourcing and assembling the parts to make the scam disk is really easy. The Teensy 3.1 is readily available online for about 20 bucks. You also need a USB-A to micro USB-B adapter, which we got from Amazon from a manufacturer called StarTech, and we removed the rubber casing to make it fit better into a case. We also designed a 3D printable enclosure that can be made on any FDM printer, which means manufacturing the parts of the scam disk that can't be bought off the shelf costs about 25 cents. This is a video demonstration of how to assemble the scam disk from its component parts. Uh, as you can see, the Teensy and USB adapter fit right together. They get inserted into the plastic enclosure and then clamped down with a plug. Included in the design are a cap and a hole for a keychain, just to make it look more believable. As you can see, there are no fasteners or adhesives involved in the design, which means it's easy to disassemble so you can get access to the Teensy for reprogramming. So what can the scam disk do? It lets you execute arbitrary human interface device attacks by plugging it into a target machine. It executes keystrokes, which can then be used to get you shell access, which gets you almost anything you want. This enables alternative methods of achieving some of the same results that were shown in the bad USB talk. For example, they reprogrammed a USB device to work as a network adapter for phishing, but you could do a similar attack by having the scam disk modify the target's host file, redirecting a site to a server that you control. We used a framework called Cotillia to develop HID payloads for Kali Linux. We made a standard vector for opening up a terminal and then sending any keyboard commands we want. Using this, we implemented two payload examples to show different kinds of attacks. This first demonstration happens pretty fast. After it's inserted into the USB port, the scam disk sends keyboard commands that open up a terminal and then set up a reverse shell connection to a remote server. In this case, I'm using an Amazon Web Services machine that lets me control the target computer remotely even after the scam disk has been removed. In this second example, we're going to show how to download and execute code from the internet. After getting access to the terminal, the scam disk downloads an executable file from a public pastebin posting. Then it executes the local code and bam, you're running whatever code you want on the target computer. These examples show that a well-designed human interface device attack can be really devastating. The scam disk has a number of limitations. For one thing, it's a fair bit larger than your average USB device, which can make some people suspicious. This could be improved by using a smaller USB adapter or by wiring up the connections yourself. Additionally, because the enclosure is 3D printed, there will be variations in the surface texture, accuracy, and the overall fit of the device based on the machine you used. The images on the right show just how much the perceived quality of the device could change based on how it's printed. Both of these devices were printed on the same printer, but onto different surfaces. More professional looking devices could be made by using different manufacturing techniques such as selective laser sintering or stereolithography. Unlike the hacked USB devices shown in bad USB, the Scamdisk can only execute human interface device attacks. While we've shown that these can be effective, they don't take advantage of some of the more interesting aspects of USB, such as the ability to represent more than one device class on a single piece of hardware. However, the Scamdisk design is hosted publicly under a Creative Commons license, which would allow anybody to adapt it to use a different microcontroller that might take advantage of these other features. Like many social engineering attacks, choosing a target carefully is really important. Payloads have to be designed with a specific operating system, desktop environment, and set of user credentials in mind. 
The attacks are also fairly visible while they're running, which means you should probably try and distract your target after you insert the scam disk into their computer. Thanks for watching! More information on our project and about the original bad USB presentation are available in the description. Have an awesome day!